A young Otakuho loves bad games, always plays them looking for the worst of them all, until at a certain point he decides to play a really good game, and is surprised. Well the EP starts with a huge beast writhing in pain, until finally, it ends up dying, and then Furia thanks Sunraku, its hero, for the help he in turn says he had waited a long time for that moment. However, his expression changes slightly, and the guy attacks the elf saying that she is the true evil god who threatens the world, and the scene cuts to the guy who was playing that game. And the crazy guy was ecstatic, having finally beaten the game, and then a voice explains that screen games have become retro, as currently virtual reality games are the new trend of the moment. And although many games are being released, their design is not keeping up with improved graphics technology, and these games are known as bad games, so most gamers despise these types of games. But on the other hand, there are those who like them and look for them, such as young Ruruko Hitsutome, who is obsessed with bad games. The boy says he feels like a free prisoner after finishing one of these games. And then, the hunter of bad games is getting ready to clear the next one, well, the next day he says good morning to his mother, and says that one of his pet butterflies ran away, after that, the boy goes to school. And a girl stands at a distance rehearsing questions to start a conversation with him, but when she goes to talk to Hitsutome, a colleague gets in the way and disrupts everything, the two then continue on their way talking about bad games. And meanwhile, in a game store called Rock Roll, the manager pastes a poster on the wall, referring to a new game, Iwamaki comments about the summer vacation that starts the next day, so she feels that the sales of her establishment will take off. Well, the girl from before suddenly appears in the store, and then we find out that her name is Rei, and she was there looking for Hitsutome, but the manager regrets it, saying that he hadn't been there that day. But Rei tries to change the conversation, and says that she was at the store to see the new games released, however Iwamaki is not convinced by this excuse, and reveals that Rei is terrible at hiding her real intentions. And she explains that the young man just didn't go there in the last few days because of a game he was playing, apparently Hitsutome was having difficulty finishing it, and Rei questions which game it would be so sister points to the Furia Kokonaikal. And the girl comments that she heard about this game from her sister, and she says that the game is really very difficult, Mana adds to this, saying that the game is excellent at being bad, because the intelligence of our allies is horrible. Furthermore, the enemies are very annoying, apart from the countless bugs that the game has, and this makes it a very good, bad game, for those who like it, and Mana explains that if the player doesn't have the skill, they won't even be able to get past the first boss. And as if that weren't enough, she says that to beat the last boss, it is necessary to wear swim shorts and a mask, as this would improve our character's efficiency for some reason. And while they talk, Hitsutome himself shows up at the store, and asks for another bad game, where the boy is welcomed by Mana, and she notices that after he arrives, Rei simply disappears out of nowhere. And he asks her what she was talking about, but she says it's nothing, and asks if he would have cleared Furia Poop Nichols, and then the bad games, Otaku smiles with pride, and reveals that he has already cleared it. And Mana asks how the experience was, and the boy says that this was the worst game he's ever played, but he says this with the greatest happiness in the world, and while they talk, Rei is watching him from afar. And Hitsutome explains that the game's biggest problem was Furia herself, as she always got in the way, causing the death of her friends and the village's residents, and to make matters worse, the girl never took responsibility for her actions. In fact, she always put the blame on the evil god, the last boss of the game, and while he talks, Mana just pretends to be paying attention, and goes back to commenting on his incredible feat in beating that game. And Hitsutome says that he managed to punish Furia, because he discovered that in the last three minutes of the game before the credits arrive, you can hit her, as if it were a secret event in the game, but even though the girl was a thorn in his side, he he says it was this hatred that made him move forward. Even because he would need to reach the end, to be able to take out his hatred on Furia, and for Hitsutome that feeling he felt was as if he had been purified. And well, the boy then says that he can't think of another bad game to play after this one, but she suggests that he play something good this time, after all, if he's used to rubbish games, he'll certainly know how to make the most of a good game. And then Mana points to the poster for the game, Shangri-La Frontier, saying that it has more than 30 million active players, and suggests that the boy have fun with a game aimed at the general public from time to time. And then he stares at the poster, and reflects on being in front of a good and flawless game, and well, he goes back to his house thinking about this game, and remembers that it was included in the Guinness Book because of having the greater number of simultaneous players. He then continues researching the game on the internet, and discovers that its lore slash story is about a space colony that travels the universe, and they would have left a new human society shortly after disappearing. And after a thousand years, players live freely accompanied by medieval technologies, 
and this worldview allows players to include science fiction elements in their journeys. And after reading briefly about the game, Hitsutome comes to the conclusion that it is worth playing, because unlike Furia, it has a wider range of fans and positive reviews, which makes it a very different game from what he is used to. And well, he starts the game, and is introduced to a new software called Utopia, whose acronym would be UES, and this program was developed by Tsukuyo Tsukuri, a programmer who developed a completely immersive virtual reality system. So Hitsutome puts on his VR, and gets ready to play a good game after a long time, and when he is in the class selection area, the boy notices a multitude of possibilities, and selects the class of a mercenary with two swords, as he finds it very versatile. And after that, he selects Naturalness Wanderer for your character, after all this will give him more luck bonuses, and this increases his chance of getting a critical hit, which will result in more items for him. And well, Hitsutome gets to the part of choosing his character's appearance, and soon becomes enchanted by the infinity of possibilities, because he was used to playing just rubbish games, so simple things like this are already capable of cheering him up. And after spending time dedicating himself to customizing his doll, he arrives at a somewhat deplorable result. But to protect our protagonist's honor, it is explained to us that he has no interest in pervert fashion. He just chose that way of dressing for convenience, because by ignoring armor he would get the best weapons possible, and as in SLF it is possible to sell our armor initially, this makes us start the game with the possibility of buying weapons. But as it would be shameful to play completely naked, Hitsutome decides to hide his face with a bird mask, and finally, he names his character as, Sunraku, a name he always uses when playing any game. And well, he finishes and lies down, then the prologue of the game appears on the screen, and tells about a long time ago there was an era, called, Age of the Gods, and the greatest gods would have passed on their knowledge. After that, many years have passed, and the story begins with the heirs of the gods, then Hitsutome wakes up in an unknown forest, and is soon amazed by the immersion of that virtual reality, as it is as if he were in real life. Furthermore, the motion controls are much better than the game, Furia Poop Nichols, but he still feels lost, and thinks the game should start with a tutorial for beginners. However, a voice explains that he chose, Wanderer, as his birthplace, and that's why he was thrown into a random area of the map, he then starts to analyze the game map, and points to the unrestrained forest, and also notes that the initial city called Firstia is located to the east. And when he turns his face, Hitsutome can already see the city on the horizon, so he decides to go there while exploring the other things, and when the boy throws himself from the tree to the ground, he lands safely, and that makes him all silly, because I'm not used to a good game. And on the way to the city, Hitsutome realizes that his body is vulnerable, but he still decides to count on his luck, and that luck was about to be tested, as a goblin comes and attacks him. He then takes out his swords and manages to kill him with a single blow. Hitsutome then considers it a very easy fight, but understands that he is possibly an initial enemy. Well, he levels up and acquires the goblin's axe, and when he picks it up, he notices that the durability of that weapon was already at half, so it shouldn't last long. And at that moment he starts to feel a presence, coming from the middle of the forest, and begins to reflect on all those sensations that only games can provide, so Hitsutome decides that he will make the most of it all. And then a bloodthirsty rabbi that goes on the attack, and knocks down the tree that was behind him, and seeing that ferocity, Hitsutome realizes that he cannot take any damage from that enemy, otherwise he will die instantly. But the rabbit attacks him again, and soon receives a critical attack, however just one critical is not able to finish him off, so the rabbit goes at him again, but the boy was already smart, as he realized that his enemy only attacks you in the neck. In this he defends himself and finally manages to kill the devil's rabbit, and is soon amazed at the amount of XP he gained, it seems that his enemy was really very strong, but still, he didn't drop any weapons for Hitsutome. But to compensate, he reached a new condition, which allows him to learn skills using certain actions, and he notices that he hasn't used any skills yet, but he also realizes that the player's skills complement each other when it comes to dodging and defending, which allows so that he can face higher level enemies. And that makes him want to acquire more different fighting styles, to test his best skills, and well, Hitsutome remembers a strange thing, he's been playing that game for a long time and still hasn't encountered a single bug. Yes, for a player accustomed to garbage, this would really be impressive, so things like becoming invisible out of nowhere, walking through walls and bugs when attacking the enemy are things that don't exist in that game. And Hitsutome is amazed by all that, and soon decides that he will catch the breed of that strongest rabbit, and on the way he faces a giant, thus acquiring a spinning ability. Furthermore, he levels up once again, thus reaching level 12. But this does not satisfy him, the boy longs for more fights with another, Vorpal Rabbit, as he understands that they are rare enemies, 
after all Hitsutome took a long time to achieve drop a set of this rabbit's knives. He keeps in mind that he needs to defeat around 50 of them, as he believes that this will give his knives a 5% rate, as it is a rare item, so the boy decides to use those weapons more carefully. And well, he reveals that he learned numerous skills in the middle of his journey, but only screw drilling proved to be useful, and then seeing that he wouldn't be able to evolve there, he opens his map to look for another place to go. And then Hitsutome notices that he is very close to Sackendale, the second city, and to get to it, he will need to cross the valley bridge that is in front of him, and when he arrives at the entrance, he realizes that there is a guardian of the bridge who needs be defeated. However, this does not intimidate him, in fact the boy becomes more excited, as he will finally have a worthy enemy, he then analyzes the attacks he could receive from a snake monster, which would be attacking him with poison, squeezing his body until he dies, or even hit him with your tail. But as the game has no bugs that would hinder him, Hitsutome feels confident and attacks the enemy without worrying about his defense. Well, the game's starting city, called First Hia, a mysterious player leaves everyone open mouth as she had high-level equipment, in addition to the respected emblem she carried. And this suggested that she would be from a clan focused on achievements, so everyone wondered why someone with such a high level would be in the starting city. And well, she comments that Hizutome always uses the same name on his characters, and so she thought she could find him just by his name, and as beginner players always go to that city, the girl imagined she would find him there. Well, when the girl takes off her RV, we discover it's Ray, and she sighs in disappointment, but still hopes to find him, as she thinks it was just a disagreement between the two. And meanwhile, Suranku prepares to attack the boss that prevents him from crossing the bridge, he then makes the first attack, ending up on the snake's back, then he plans to read his enemy's movements so as to have some advantage over he. And then Suranku activates his tap step ability, which improves his evasion when receiving attacks, so the snake starts trying to hit him, but misses every blow. And so he comes to the conclusion that this was a boss for beginner players, as her attacks were easy to predict, but he should kill her without taking any damage, so as not to die. And Suranku goes up, to try to end that fight, but in doing so, his sword breaks, and although he had already realized that its durability was low, he didn't count on it breaking with the first blow. And well, he analyzes that the boss's skin is very tough, and in response to that, he decides to use the rabbit's knives against the snake, and after being thrown up by the snake, Suranka decides to use his bolt piercing. However, he is interrupted by a purple slime released by the snake, he then looks at himself, wondering what that was, he looks at his status, and discovers that it was poison that takes damage from him every 10 seconds. And after getting screwed, Suranka confesses that he underestimated that boss too much, and when looking at the snake, he notices a very confident look in it, as if he already considered him defeated. However, he states that he has played bad games, much more absurd than that, and so he will not weaken just because he was hit with poison. And as the poison only takes one damage from him every 10 seconds, Suranku understands that you still have 4 minutes to defeat the boss. But to defeat him, he will need to land more critical hits on his enemy somehow, and as in that game critical hits are not random, this makes Earth deduce that there are different ways to inflict these hits on each of the enemies. In other words, he must discover the snake's weak point, in order to land critical blows, and as that creature is covered in hard scales, he believes that its weak point is its head. And then Suranku goes on the attack, but he is unable to aim precisely, so he understands that he will need to create an opening to land a precise blow on the boss's head. And so he uses his bolt piercing ability, leaving the snake writhing in pain, and then Suranka starts attacking that wound more often. Because the defensive properties of the injured part were eradicated to that area, making him able to land several critical blows just by attacking that region. And then he starts attacking it until he gets tired, as he can't identify how much HP the snake still has left, and well, the snake manages to disperse it with its tail. And Suranku confesses that he felt too confident about having managed to defeat Furia Poop Nikel, and when he looks at his enemy, he realizes that the wound has regenerated. And he says he thought that game was it was just a casual game with a high rating, and I thought I was capable of defeating the boss without healing but he was very arrogant, and in that Suranku is bitten by the snake. But in an act of bravery he manages to free himself from that tragic end, and thus manages to land a precise blow on the snake's head, and then hits the head with the bolt piercing attack, and in this way he manages to defeat the boss. In this Suranku goes up from level 12 to level 14, in addition, he gets the items snake scale and white snake hair, and when he gets them, he gets excited, as he believes that those items are worth a fortune. However, he wakes up to life and remembers that the poison is still taking effect on him, so Suranku opens his stats, to distribute his points for having leveled up. And so he puts everything into energy and agility, so he can run to the city and buy an antidote as soon as possible, 
but on the way he remembers that he doesn't know where the stores are, in other words, we have another problem to deal with. He resolves. And well, two random players talk about taming pets, and Mia says she can't have them in her apartment, however she knows that monsters are possible to breed in that game. And Mia says that she will count on him to help her in this matter, and in the boy's mind, he is ecstatic because he managed to get the girl in love with him to start playing SLF. And besides, Yamamoto also feels happy to be mentoring her on her journey as a newcomer, she then notices that the boy is in the moon world, and asks what is happening. But he says it's okay, but asks her not to call him, Yamamoto, as one of the rules of etiquette in the game is to call the other player by their nickname, and not by their real name. Then she understands the rule and calls him Reiji again, and the boy feels great, after all, Reiji, is his first name in real life, and he made her call him that. And well, the two begin to hear Suranko's terrified arrival in the city, and Mia feels that he would be a threat, but Reiji tells her that that guy in a hurry was another player, as he had a name in his head. And then he asks her not to attack him, and explains that if she does, she will become a PK and have a skull in front of her name, and in this way she would keep other players away from her. So Mia understands and decides not to attack him, but she still doesn't understand why Suranku is running so much, and Reiji says that he could have been hit by a poison poop. And well, he shouts at the player, telling him to keep going straight, and explains that the white building right behind him is an inn, but tells him to be careful, as his return points will not be recorded until he lies down in bed. He then thanks her for the help and heads off at full speed, and Reiji explains to Mia that this type of situation occurred a lot at the beginning of the game, and says that when they are poisoned by snakes, players run to the nearest city as soon as possible. And when looking at Suranka better, Reiji comments that he is possibly focusing on agility, in addition to thinking that the player sold his weapons, to which Mia says that he sounded like a real veteran when helping that unknown player. And upon hearing this, he mentally thanks Suranku for appearing there, and well, upon arriving at the inn, the receptionist spends a lot of time explaining the services they provide there. But Suranku becomes desperate and asks for anything bed as soon as possible, as he was already at his last HP and would die soon, and realizing the urgency of the case, the receptionist says that room 102 is available. So he hurries and jumps on the bed, and so he registers his return point, but the guy gets emotional and gets up to celebrate, and this ends up killing him in the end. And then his stats are temporarily lowered, like a penalty for dying, and he returns to the real world, feeling relieved that he got to bed in time, but soon realizing that he actually ended up dying anyway. However, Hitsuto managed to secure his items, and he remembers the player who showed him where the inn was, and this makes him want to thank him the next time he sees him in the game. And although he went through all this trouble, Hitsutome thinks that SLF is a fantastic and very interesting game, and well, he goes back to the game, and has his first experience being in a city, in this case he is in Second Ale. And he notes that he needs a map and some recovery items to continue his journey, and in addition, Suranku feels that he needs a more powerful main weapon to replace his mercenary double sword. In this he promises himself that he will be able to do all these things, and finally, go after the best players, but soon he is mocked by the people around him, for wearing a slightly embarrassing outfit. And then he decides that he will start by buying some new clothes, and he does so because he was tired of being treated like a stranger by the other players, and as for his weapon, he goes to a store to try to sell his hand axe. Goblin. But the seller refuses to buy that weak weapon, so Suranku asks to see the weapons the man was selling, but when he goes through the weapon list he doesn't find anything to his liking. And he says that his Vorpal Machete is a much better weapon than any of those, so the merchant comments that in fact this weapon is very rare, and says that if he wants something better than that, he will have to make his own weapon. So Suranku asks if the man could make it for him, and the guy replies that he will do it if he brings the raw material, and with that he leaves for the Swamp of Difficulties, a place that has ore and is on the way between Second Ale and Thirdrima, the third city. And well, he goes to this place to collect ore, to take it to the merchant and thus be able to have his new powerful weapon, but when he breaks one of the stones he realizes that he got a normal stone. He then starts mining other stones, until he finds a grey ore, but Suranku explains that to make a good weapon, he you'll need about 5 more of that ore. However, he notices that he had already been using that pickaxe for 30 minutes and only managed to collect 2 ores, and to make things even more difficult, the mud in that swamp made it difficult for him to walk. And the pickaxe he bought to do that job was too heavy, in other words, nothing was in his favor, and then as if that wasn't enough, a mud frog comes to him and bothers him. And he jumps next to Suranku, smearing him with mud but as the animal wasn't being aggressive, he decided to leave him alive, but out of nowhere the key in his head changes, and he attacks him with the pickaxe, saying that he will end the frog. And well, Suranku says that the anti-blade leather he's using is made from mud-toed skin, as well as being blade-resistant, 
and with that in mind, that weapon certainly wouldn't be lethal against the toad either. In other words, he will have to resort to other methods of attack, so he takes his goblin hand axe and goes to the frog, with a great desire to finish off the creature. However, his movements were too slow, due to the swamp's mud reducing the player's movements, and after a lot of patience he finally reached the frog. And since he has an oval body, Zarenka deduces that he won't be able to get up that easily, and this leaves him vulnerable to his attacks now, he then kills the frog, and gets the mud frog skin item. And although he wanted to kill him, Zarenka feels that it was so easy that it wasn't even funny, so he decides to go back to mining, but soon notices two new players in the area, and feels that he will see even more when the summer holidays arrive. In other words, it will only be a matter of time before a race for materials starts, so to avoid having to get involved in that, he has the idea of collecting as much as he can from now on. Well, after collecting the ores, he goes back to trading, and leaves the man open-mouthed with how much he managed to collect in just three hours. And he questions whether that amount will be enough to make a good weapon, so the man shows the list of weapons that he will be able to provide for him with those ores. And as he looked at the list, the man was impressed by one of his ores, in this case it was the swamp coffin fossil, but Surenka describes it as a strange object. And the man says he can use that ore to make the weapon, well, he chooses the weapon he wants, and asks the man to make two of it, and after going out to buy items, Suranka returns to the store. And the man had finished his swords, and when he picked them up, he was very excited about his new weapon, because in addition to being divine, it also reduced the drop in durability of the swords after delivering a critical blow. And this makes them perfect weapons for his style of play, and you say that Suranku should bring him ores frequently, so that he continues to keep his weapons well maintained. After all, this is also part of his job, and he explains that as a user of forge magic, he can also improve weapons, but as they are like children to blacksmiths, they usually call it, cultivating, the weapon, weapon, and not improving it. So Suranku understands the man's logic, and is amazed at how that NPC was so well articulated, from his conversation to even very well done gestures. And well, the man says the sun is already setting, and advises him not to go out in the city with the armor he is wearing, and Suranku questions why. And he explains that night monsters are dangerous, he is impressed by this, as he didn't know that was in the game, and says that he will be careful, but when he leaves the store his mentality changes, as his penalty for death has already passed. Furthermore, he had obtained great information, and with that, Suranku prepared to hunt these night monsters, to debut his new weapons and gain many levels. And well, Rei was still interested in finding Hizutome in the game, and it's strange that she hasn't managed to do so yet, after all, she had already searched for him throughout the beginner player area. And she comes to that snake that he had defeated previously, and she also defeats it with the greatest ease, and then it comes to her mind that possibly Hitsutome managed to defeat that snake without going through the city and without dying, and then he would have gone to second ale. However, she wonders if a new player would be able to achieve all these feats, but in Hitsutome's case, she believes he could do that. Well, the scene cuts to Suranku fighting a goblin with a red hat, and he decides to organize the information he has collected so far, in which he remembers that the appearance of monsters varies with day and night. And night monsters tend to be more aggressive and dangerous, just as the weapon seller had told him, and this helped him level up and learn new skills, but the price of this is having to face these very powerful monsters. He then notices that the attacks of that specific goblin are very different from those of the forest goblins, in addition, he has more HP and incorporates feints into his fighting style almost instinctively. But to make matters worse, the monster calls more allies, and this makes Suranku angry, as calling reinforcements should only be a skill for weak monsters, because he was already having a lot of trouble fighting just one, so now everything has gotten worse once and for all. And he feels that even if he runs at full steam, he won't be able to survive. But when he realizes that he was thinking about running away, Suranku changes his mentality immediately, and decides to stay in the fight. And after dodging their blows, he finally finishes them all, and feels that the game was so fun to the point of making him addicted, even if it wasn't one of those bad games. And well, after defeating the tough goblins, another monster appears, and at that moment Hizutome feels like he was just discovering the real Shangri-La frontier, while that monster now was called Lycaean Unique Monster, also known as the Attacker of Night. And that monster lets out a violent growl, shaking the whole place, and after that we are shown a room where there is a computer on the table, and in that computer it says that in the history of that world no single monster has been defeated yet. Ray returns to the game, and looking for Hitsutome, she asks two players if his name really was Sunraku, and the boy says yes, but Mia finds that being strange and threatens to attack him. But the boy stops her, saying that that being was another player just like them, and the girl is surprised, 
as she thought Ray was one of the monsters in the game, after all she has a scary appearance. However, his friend says that even though she was scary, she was still just any player, and well, Ray questions where the player, Sunraku, had gone, and the boy starts explaining that he had the giant snake's venom. And then he would have run to second ale, and Ray asks if the player was half naked and wearing a bird's head, and the boy says yes, but explains that he may have changed his equipment, and Mia says that his mask had a scary expression, making her mistake him for a monster too. And upon hearing this, Ray was assured that Hitsutome really defeated the voracious snake without visiting the first city, and well, she thanks them both for the information, and gives them a coordinate teleporter, as a form of gratitude. After that, Ray leaves the place quickly, saying he was in a hurry. So Mia wonders who that girl was, and her colleague says he doesn't know either. However, he recognizes the emblem she has on her cover. And he explains that he is from a guild that focuses on the unique monster, Lycaon, also known as the Night Attacker, but Mia still appears to not have understood what he was talking about, in which he explains that unique monsters are a special class of monsters. And they have a name and a title, and the boy says that when they kill a common monster, it reappears as a new individual, after a certain period, as for unique monsters, there is only one of each in the world. And the boy comments on a certain rumor, which tells about there being seven of these unique monsters in SLF, but the criteria on how to find them is not so clear, so for each of these unique monsters, several players have created clans, whose objective is hunt them down and defeat them. And then he ends by basically saying that these monsters are rare and very powerful, and he says that the game is over a year old and has over 30 million players, and yet none of these unique monsters have been defeated. And well, we go back to Sanraku, and he manages to find Lycaon, the well-known attacker of the night, and the two stare at each other for a long time, until Sanraku remembers that the little red hats were defeated by that creature in an instant, and they were very strong. Therefore, he understands that if he takes a hit from this creature, he will die instantly. He then receives a blow from the creature, but manages to defend himself. Then he tries to attack it too and disdains the unique monsters, saying that they were no big deal. But inside Sanraku was terrified and says that he didn't die nearly, as his training helped him resist the monster's blow, after all, if he hadn't learned the perfect parry, he would be dead. And well, the monster attacks him again, and Sanraku decides that he must attack with everything, as any mistake is enough for him to die in the blink of an eye. He then takes his swords from the rabbit and activates his tap dancing ability, and so he manages to land a critical attack, and he already feels like a good guy, but the monster starts attacking him more intensely. And then the monster disappears and appears on his back, but receives more critical hits again, and then he disappears again, and Sunraku is in a state of alert, waiting for the monster's next attacks. And then the beast appears, giving him multiple blows, but all of them miss. But when Sunraku least expects it, Lycaon uses a teleportation ability, and to defend himself, Sunraku uses the perfect parry again. And Lycaon disappears again, but reappears afterwards, in an attempt to tire Sunraku, and then he notices that the skin of that being is harder than the scales of the voracious snake, so the feeling that Sunraku has is that he is attacking Lycaon there are 5 minutes for nothing. After all, that creature shouldn't even be feeling the damage from his blows, and this explains the fact that Sunraku did not defeat him even after delivering more than 200 critical blows to him, in addition, his vorpal machetes were new before starting the fight. And now they are practically in pieces. And then he deduces that he will need to find a softer spot to hit him, otherwise his weapons will crumble before he himself is killed, but upon analyzing the situation further, Sunraku comes to the conclusion that this is not an opponent for him at the time. And for Sunraku, the combat is even better this way, because that's what makes Shangri-La Frontier a divine game for him, because all that immersion is something new for him because Hitsutome is used to playing only bad games. And well, he understands that that monster couldn't be defeated with the help of bugs, just like the enemies in the bad games he played, and so Sunraku hits him again and ends up flying further away, leaving him in a distance at which it could not be hit by Lycaon. However, the monster starts to howl, making Sunraku's body immobile, then he disappears and hits him, and Sunraku doesn't understand where that hit came from. In this he feels that reality is very heavy and cruel, as he wouldn't learn a new skill out of nowhere, 
nor would he be saved by a mysterious high-level player, and even thinking about all this, he feels that there is still something in him. Favor. In this case, it would be his 1 HP. After all he took a blow from a unique monster, and for Sunraku, he shouldn't even be alive anymore. And he understands that as a miracle, and tells Lycaon that he is very strong. However, he justifies that strength as the result of very well done programming, and says that that monster certainly became stronger than its creators expected, but because it is programming, Sunraku says that it is certainly possible to be defeated. And well, he decides that one day he will end that monster, but not today, and asks Lycaon not to let anyone defeat him before him, but before Sunraku can leave the fight, Lycaon hits him with his curse mark. And then he returns to his return point at the second ale inn, and he soon notices that mark and seeks to know more about it, in which he discovers that he cannot equip the parts of the body on which Lycaon's curse is. And upon reading this, he wonders if he really was screwed, and those marks on his body are strange, as he couldn't equip anything on his torso and legs, and well, he goes back to reading about the curse, and discovers that in addition, monsters of a lower level than him will run when they bump into him. With Sunraku. And your conversations with NPCs will also be affected by the presence of Lycaon's curse, however the affected body part gains resistance to magical effects, and there are only two ways to undo the curse it must be removed through the prayers of a saint, or so, Sunraku will have to defeat whoever is responsible for placing the curse on him. And so he decides to go out on the street, to enjoy the beautiful day outside, but he remembers all the misfortune that is happening to him, and shouts that that style of curse is typical of the bad games he played. And then the people around classify him as crazy, because in addition to walking around half-naked, the guy is still shouting strange things, so he decides to remain calm, and remembers the three principles he learned from bad games, which would be to have a patient heart, an unshakable spirit and being cool in your decisions. And then he goes back to analyzing his data, and discovers that he gained a lot of experience points from facing one of the unique monsters, and this means that he leveled up and improved his skills, causing him to gain a lot of status points to allocate. And this would be a good time for Sunraku to define his status distribution, but he feels that he should allocate those 50 points carefully, but when he makes the distribution, he notices that he needed to put more points in vitality. And this frustrates him, as it makes him feel like he is made of paper and could be killed with any blow, but Sunraku has no choice, after all he ran out of two spaces to place armor, making his defense naturally lower. And then he understands that he must compensate for these bad things by increasing his speed and resistance as well, and when looking at his stats, he notices that the best of them is luck, and Sunraku believes that this explains the fact that he was left with 1 HP at that time. And well, he leans against the wall and laments, because he believes he should do something about it. After all he's been through a lot, and he thinks that at least he should count on his luck, since he's in a lot of trouble. And then a rabbit appears, jumping on his head, and Sunraku wonders why there is a rabbit there, but when he looks closely, he notices that it is a slightly different Vorpal rabbit, but Sunraku finds it strange that the game lets monsters spawn in the city, and the rabbit calls him to go to a place with him, and on the way Sunraku notices that that rabbit's clothes are different from that of a normal Vorpal rabbit, and so he deduces that if he captures him, he will win a rare item. And well, after cornering the rabbit he tries to attack, but he leans against the wall, causing a shiny door to appear, and after the rabbit enters it, Sunraku reads the warning on the door, which suggests that it is an invitation from the country of rabbits, called Unique Scenario. And then Hitsutome remembers that he saw something like that on the walkthrough website, where he read about the SLF having a long history of exploring the world, in addition, he found out that the game has several parallel missions. And one of the sets of these missions is called, Unique Scenarios, which are mysterious scenarios unknown to the general public, as it is not possible to know when or where they will appear, and it is also unknown what they are. And for these reasons, the equipment, skill and spells that can be acquired in these unique scenarios are always of high level, and therefore many clans desperately seek them, and finding one so early makes him very excited, and makes him believe that everything is due to his high luck status, and so he enters the place, because he wouldn't let an opportunity like that pass by. However, he forgot to read one of the notices on the door, which said that to enter there, it would be recommended that the player be level 80, and well, 
he arrives in a place called rabbits, and immediately wonders where he is. And when he looks around, the only species he is able to see are the deadly rabbits, and he understands that he ended up falling into the monster's lair. But that rabbit from before comes to welcome him, and says he really wanted to find it. But besides him, the rabbit says that everyone in rabbits is excited to meet him, as he fought bravely with Lycaon even though he was weak, and everyone started to admire him for that, after all he compensated for his weakness with his skill, delivering several mortal blows to the monster without taking a single attack. And with that, the rabbit says that Sun Raku is the personification of the Vorpal soul, but he says that he didn't even cause a scratch on his enemy, but the rabbit says that this happens because Lycaon is very strong, and he explains that he is one of the most powerful monsters, and says that Lycaon feeds on wyverns as his snack. And then the rabbit goes back to kissing Sun Raku's ass, saying that just because he's there and can talk to him, it's already a sign that Sun Raku is one of the pioneers with divine protection, and he explains that those marks on his body are proof of that. Because Lycaon doesn't just have him as prey, those marks represent that the unique monster recognized him as an individual, and Hitsutome wonders who that rabbit could be, as he finds it strange that he is a simple NPC. And well, he remembers that one of the effects of the curse is having his conversations with NPCs affected, and then the rabbit says that the chief of the Vorpal rabbits would like to talk to him, and that's precisely why they told him to go find him. Then he begins to think that their boss would be seeking revenge, after all Sun Raku killed many Vorpal rabbits in his path, and well, the rabbit introduces himself as a mole and goes up the stairs. And then Sun Raku is confused as to whether that would really be artificial intelligence, as he would just ask his name at that moment, and on the way a mole tells him not to worry about his boss, as he is not the type to think about revenge. Well, they arrive at the rabbit palace, and Sun Raku is impressed by how well built the place was, and Amol says that a large number of humans visit rabbits, but he would be the first human to visit the palace. In other words, that is a unique scenario that only he is aware of until then, and Sun Raku remembers that when he was marked by Lycaon, he had been worried, but apparently he was right to have done that, as Sun Raku's game changed from water for wine. And well, Amal takes him to a room and tells his boss that he brought the human with a Vorpal soul that he had asked for, and when he looks at the place, Sun Raku is amazed, and the boss says that they were already taking a long time to arrive. And he asks if he was the one who took a beating from Lycaon, who he affectionately calls a nerd, and Sunraku says yes, to which the boss says he didn't expect to find a human with as much talent as him, and then, the boss of the rabbit's Vorpais asks to take some of Sunraku's time, and introduces himself as Visek, rabbit's boss. Ray returns to the game store and is soon answered by Mana, who asks if she is going to the dojo, the girl is then scared, but answers yes, and says that she was just passing by to check if Mana had a good game. But the woman soon notices what Ray wanted there, and says that Hitsutome didn't come to buy any more games, and Mana suggests that he is possibly immersed in Shangri-La, after all, they are already on summer vacation. Well, she asks if Ray has already found him in the game and the girl is immediately sad, and comments about Mana having said that he always played with Sun Raku, and when searching for that player name, Ray discovers that he would have skipped the first city in the game, which serves as a tutorial for newcomers. And upon hearing this, Mana bursts into laughter, and understands that Hitsuto must just be forging his own path, and says that this is typical of bad game maniacs, that is, he will do things that ordinary players normally wouldn't do. And Mana says that he will find all kinds of unique scenarios, because of his different way of playing the game, and Ray comments that not for Hitsutome, this in fact would not be impossible. And well, Mana tries to reassure the girl, saying that she will definitely find him at some point, she advises Ray to declare herself to him at that moment, well, in the meantime, Rumi says goodbye to Hitsutome, saying that he will be returning late to home because of work. But his only focus is on the game, and the boy dives into research, trying to find out more about the unique scenarios recommended for beginners, and also researching the conditions to activate the rabbit country. Well, when reading the game walkthrough, Hitsutome discovers that when defeating a higher level monster with Vorpal weapons, a special Vorpal rabbit will appear in some city, and will invite him to rabbits the country of rabbits, 
and this rabbit he will run away without saying anything so the player must be careful not to lose sight of him. And as soon as he arrives in rabbits, if the player defeats the monster that attacks the country, in this case, the rabbit eating snake, the player will learn the spell, Vorpal Charm, and well, after reading this, Hitsutome comments that it doesn't it has nothing to do with the unique scenario you played the day before. After all, he didn't find any snakes or anything like that, in fact what he found was a giant rabbit that was as intimidating as Lycaon, who was interrogating him, asking if he had really faced Lycaon. And because he has all this determination, Viseik says that Sun Raku has a Vorpal soul, and says that he would be happy if he could train him, in this he begins to understand better what is happening there, and notices that the rabbit is proposing a mission to him, of training. Furthermore, Sunraku is excited about the possibility of benefits that he can achieve there, so he would not be able to refuse that mission, and after accepting it, he calls the rabbit, bro, and this makes him a little furious, but Sunraku tries to control the situation, saying he was just playing a joke. However, Viseik stamps his foot, showing that he is still angry, and Sunraku feels that he ruined everything, and thinks that he chose the wrong answer to the rabbit's question, and then his hand starts flying towards him, and finally, the rabbit he pats him on the shoulder, saying he liked Sunraku's style, and he says he accepted his training, makes him his little brother, and says that Sunraku can call him Vash, because the rabbit saw potential in the boy, and explains that only privileged people can call him by that nickname, in which he feels relieved because he thought he had chosen the wrong answer. And well, Vash asks Amul to take care of his new apprentice, and when he is assigned to this mission, the bunny gets excited, and states that he will do his best, and then he calls Sunraku to visit the palace. However, he says that he has been playing for a long time, and he thought about going to rest a little before they start, and that leaves Amul down, but Hitsutome was only doing that so he could research more about the unique scenarios and unique monsters. And well, Amul says he will present one of his inns, so that Sun Raku can register his return point there, but before they leave, Vash throws a necklace at him, called the Vorpal Soul Necklace, and when equipped, the user receives half the experience points, but to compensate, the player gains two and a half times more status points when leveling up. But upon reading this, Sunraku doesn't really like knowing that he will lose half of his experience points, and Vash says that he won't be able to take off that necklace, unless he wants to, but he explains that Sunraku must go through those difficulties, because it will make him will make you stronger. And Amul says that that necklace suited him very well, but still, to him it sounded like a restriction, and well, Hitsutome analyzes the data, and understands that having a 2.5 times increase in status points is beneficial, even if it cuts your experience in half. And well, he goes to the game's forum, and doesn't find anyone talking about Viseik or Amul, and people also don't seem to know about the Vorpal Soul Necklace, besides, no player has found a unique scenario that leads to Rabbit's Palace. And that makes it a scenario that only Hitsutome knows. Well, he looks at the clock and notices that it's time for his appointment, in this case, he would have to meet Katso, a guy who asked him to play another game, which by the way, Hitsutome hadn't played in a long time. And then the camera takes a close-up on the game's cover, and it was Berserk Online Passion, a fighting game that Hitsutome was once addicted to, and it was obviously a bad game, so much so that its user base reduced to less of 100 people per day. And this leaves everyone wondering why their service is still standing, well, this small number of players means that everyone knows each other there. In addition, they all have a taste for bad games in common. And as soon as Sunraku arrives, Katso was already waiting for him, and challenges him to a fight, whereupon he asks what the rules will be, and Katso says that anything goes, and then he goes after Sunraku, whereupon he notices that the doll your friend's arms are buggy, but he explains that those arms were a new technique he developed. And the technique is called, Tentacle Attack Plus 18, but upon seeing how the attack works, Sunraku says that his friend just developed a new bug, and he wonders how his friend would have become a professional player, after all the dude is just crazy. Well, Sunraku begins to return attacks, quickly attacking him with his fists, and Katso says that he is the real crazy one, because even though he uses a delay, Sunraku still manages to defend himself from his blows. In this he explains that the quick punch is the supreme style, so in theory if he has 12 frames, 
he can counter the boss's deadly attacks and still emerge unharmed, therefore, this would allow him to counter all of Katzo's blows. And while they fight, two players recognize the two and the fight continues until the whole thing goes wrong and Katzo manages to hit Sunraku, throwing him away and then he stands up and says that he had only fought against NPCs in that game. And well, Katzo comments that when he heard that Hitsutome was playing Shangri-La, he had taken it as a bad joke but now he discovered that it was really true, and Hitsutome says that he is not ashamed to admit it, and says that is addicted to the game. And he says that he has been reading on the forums about SLF having some very strong monsters, called the seven most powerful, and the boy says that the entire user base was only able to find out the names of four of these monsters, in addition, no one has managed to defeat any of them since the game service started. And Hitsutome talks about the time he fought one of those monsters and ended up defeated. Katso asks if that's what got him hooked on the game, and he replies that he's determined not to put the game down until he manages to defeat that giant dog. And upon hearing this, Katso comments that maybe he would start playing SLF and this leaves Hitsutome amazed, and the boy says that he was interested in the game, because of everything he told him, in addition, he says that none of his friends from real life play Berserk. And well, Katso tells him that someone else he knows is playing SLF2 because he had sent her an email saying that Hitsutome was playing the game, and that made her want to play too. And the scene cuts to a girl with purple hair, and the day she found out the boy was quitting bad games, she almost can't believe it because she imagined that Hitsutome would die if he stopped playing bad games, but since he's there, the girl promises that she will be very kind to him. And well, he goes back to SLF, and resumes the game in Secondale's alley, just as Amul said it would happen, and as soon as he starts to control Sunraku, he soon feels the difference in playing a good game, after all the guy was playing a bad game just now. Well, Amul reminds him that he said he wanted to go somewhere, and asks if he would like to know more about the rabbit's palace, and he says that he is interested in exploring and knowing more about the palace, but at the moment Sanraku wants to get to Thirdrima before the place fills up with people. And along the way he explains that the number of players has increased since the summer holidays began, and comments that on the game's forum, players are talking about seeing new players in the game's starting city. In other words, soon the city they are in will also be full, and this means that the establishments will have an overload of customers, and in addition, there will be a lot of fights over monsters and mining sites. And well, Sanraku says that Thirdrima is a pretty big city, so if he wants to take the unique setting seriously, the best option would be for him to do it from a big city, and one that has room for him to breathe. But while he explains things for Emul, Sanraku notices that he isn't even paying attention, and in fact he wasn't. The rabbit just wanted to help him get to the next city, and he would be happy if he could be useful with that. And then Emul offers an invitation to Sanraku to join a group called Magic Rabbit Emul, and this surprises him, as he didn't know he could have NPCs in his group, so the rabbit says he couldn't return to rabbits or the palace without him, so they should stay in touch. And Sanraku says he knows that, but he didn't know that they would have to separate, and so he accepts the invitation, and when he looks at the rabbit's status, he is impressed, because it has much better status than his, apart from the speed stat, this is the only one Sanraku has an advantage over. And well, he thinks about Lycaean's mark again, and says he's almost certain that this unique scenario was only activated because of that mark, and he wonders if Amul was the game's way of compensating for all the problems the curse brought. And with that he states that the two will work together now, and Amul jumps on his shoulder, but before the two can leave, they are surprised by two girls, who find the rabbit very cute, and ask Sanraku where he got one. Those, however, when they realize that Sanraku is half-naked, they start to find him strange, but they continue talking to Amul, and Sanraku realizes that they were talking loudly this whole time, and as Amul is an NPC linked to a unique scenario never seen before, he decides that he must keep it all a secret. And then he runs off and says the rabbit was a ventriloquism trick, but one of the girls takes a picture of the rabbit, and says she'll ask about it on the forums. Well, the two finally manage to get away from all the players, and Amul says that he wasn't meant to be running so much, but Sanraku says that running a lot is natural for a rabbit, in addition, he says that Amul has the same speed as than him. And well, the rabbit questions what they would do now, and Sanraku says that he wants to test something, 
in this case, it would be something that concerns a part of the brand's cursed text, it said that monsters of a lower level than his, will fleeing when they find him. They hear the sound of a being approaching, and as soon as the monster sees Sunraku, he actually turns around and runs away. And then he starts chasing the monster, to induce him to flee towards an obstacle, and after that, he throws his weapon in front of the enemy, to make him stop moving, and this gives him the advantage to attack the monster with the maximum speed he can. And this gives you an attack bonus due to inertia, yes, the game even has that, and Sunraku explains that naturally games don't think much about these things, but in SLF everything works in the most faithful way to reality. And when you see this, Amol praises him, saying that Sunraku did very well, to the point that he didn't even know who the real monster was there. And well, he notes that even though he has the curse mark, he could defeat monsters of that speed or less, and tells Amol that they could proceed with their next plan. In this case, his plan will be to ignore all the weaklings and go straight to the head of the area. But Amol sees this as anything but a plan. But they continue forward to the head of the area, and then arrive at Thirdrima. And on the way Sanraku opens his map and notices that the head of the area should already be nearby. There but all he sees in front of him is a swamp, and Amul complains about getting his clothes dirty, and Sunraku remembers what the rabbit had said on the way, and when asking Amul about the boss of that area, he would have said that the monster's name is Mud Digger, and he leaves the room. Lan to launch their attacks, so it would be important for them to find a way to trap him in the same place. And then Sunraku feels that he might go wrong in this fight, and Amul alerts him that the monster had arrived, then a huge creature appears from under the ground, and it is explained to us that a characteristic of the swamp in that game is that it forces everyone walking. In other words, this is the worst possible combination for Sunraku. With your plan in mind, Sunraku goes straight to the boss of the area, but upon arriving at the swamp, he and Amul come across a giant creature, called the Mud Hunter, but Sunraku already feels at a disadvantage, as he doesn't know how he will fight in that swamp that limits his speed. The monster then jumps and dives back into the swamp, and Sunraku shows that he doesn't understand how that monster could do that in such a shallow swamp, but he soon remembers that games tend to be like that. Well, the monster starts coming towards them, and Amol Ja gets scared, thinking that they were going to be eaten alive, but Sunraku tells the rabbit to hold on tight, and uses his sliding movement ability to get out of the attack point of the enemy. He then arms himself with his Vorpal Rabbit Blade, and reflects that his battle experience with Lycaon has improved several of his abilities, and he deduces that figuring out how to use them now is the key to winning that battle. The monster then attacks again, but Sunraku inhibits the blow with the Vorpal Rabbit's blade, and then launches a repellent counterattack, a blow that consists of parrying an incoming attack, and then delivering a counterattack. Attack, and Amul praises him when he sees Sunraku's great dexterity. However, he explains that he only used some skills to get out of that difficult situation and says that the problem was just beginning, in which he reflects that in a short time in battle he had already used two skills that seemed useful to avoid damage. And when looking at his status he notices that he will only be able to use these skills in 10 seconds, that is, he will not be able to avoid any damage during this waiting time, and this makes him apprehensive of what to do, but the monster goes on the attack without giving Sunraku time to think leaving him afraid of what was to come. However, Amul attacks the monster with a skill called Magic Blade, and Sunraku questions what he would have done, and the rabbit explains that it was just a spell he cast against the mud excavator, and Sunraku understands that he was so focused on playing alone who ended up forgetting that he has a partner. But he still finds the idea of a player depending on an NPC strange, but he understands that this was his chance to win the fight, therefore it was a chance that should not be wasted, so he advances on top of the monster, and tells Amul that they must reduce the distance with acceleration while the monster is down. But as he does this, he becomes irritated by how difficult it is to walk through that dense swamp, and when he is close to the creature, he finally awakens and roars with hatred, then goes on the attack, and Sunraku decides that it is time to use the evolution of screw drilling, in which he attacks the digger with the spiral blade skill, and then he uses the blade climb ability to climb it as if it were a wall, and when he reaches the monster's face he asks if Amul is in the mood to see an explosion, and the rabbit replies that he will do it on his own, and then Amul prepares his addition spell. However, the enemy starts to shake their faces, 
trying to knock them down but Sunraku warns him that he has played many bad games with worse platforms than that, that is, it wouldn't happen to knock him down. Furthermore, the 10 seconds of waiting to use his skills again had already passed, and Sunraku attacked him again with the repellent counterattack. Then Amul prepared the big explosion and launched his magic, called Blade Magic Improved by Addition. And this attack succeeds to knock down the monster, Sunraku praises Amul's accurate blow, saying that his precision was perfect, but the rabbit complains about his clothes, which ended up being stained with mud from the swamp, so they look in front of them and notice that the monster it disappeared. And Sunraku wonders where he would have ended up, but soon after the beast gives a signal making the whole swamp shake, in addition Sunraku notices that the swamp had become denser, and was making it more difficult for him to move, as the his feeling was that his feet were being sucked. Then Amul worries, and Sunraku remembers that the rabbit had said that the monster used to hold its victims in place, so it could attack them more freely, and then he picks up the rabbit and throws it away, then the monster appears, and throws Sunraku up too. But he finds that blow from the monster strange, as he imagined that he would die instantly when attacked, but his HP was still practically intact, so he understands what is happening there, as the mud digger is a quadrupedal monster like a mole, its only difference is that it has a shark's head and bar fish whiskers. And its most notable main feature is the special attack activated after its HP reaches a certain point, its attack consists of the monster diving deep into the earth, causing the swamp to vibrate and the player to become trapped in place and then throw the player into the air with your nose. And if a player challenges it alone, in addition to being heavily attacked several times, he will also lose all his HP from the fall damage, and this characteristic of the blow also makes him known as a solo killer. At this Sunraku finally understands that the enemy's idea is to kill him with a falling attack, after all his blow from before had caused him no damage, but upon noticing the enemy's strategy, Sunraku says that the creator of this boss certainly has a personality difficult, after all, that attack has no relation to the player's skill, and this leaves him with no idea what to do to get out of that situation. But then he notices that if Amul hits him in the side with his magic blade that might save him, but then he remembers that it would explode him, so he goes back to thinking about something he could do with the help of someone, item or magic, in order to save yourself. But when looking at the ground, he accepts that his end is near, and confesses that he has never managed to get used to deaths by falling in virtual reality games, as he begins to feel an electric current passing through his body, and then feels a complete loss of sensation. And then he reflects that the unnecessary search for reality led to some games being taken off the market, and well, the rabbit refuses to let his vorpal companion die, and uses a technique that teleports them both onto the monster. And then it is explained to us that there is an attack skill called Meteor Fall, which uses the energy of the fall, that is, he would have gained a lot of energy in his free fall, and when Amul teleported him on top of the mud digger, a blow that would normally be a fall and death for the player, ended up becoming a mortal blow against the monster itself. And this attack was so deadly that it ended up killing the beast, and well, when looking at his stats Sunraku is amazed that he is still alive even after having gone through all that, but in addition to being alive, he rose to level 29, and Amul goes to him to praise him for the good work. But he stops to think about everything that happened, after all, everything went very fast for him, and this is making it difficult for his brain to assimilate everything, but he doesn't care about the logic of the situation and just congratulates the rabbit for his incredible performance in combat. But Amul tells Sunraku to stop imitating what he says. And he reflects that like Lycaon, he also had a lot of difficulties there, however, just like before he also managed to survive, and thus Sunraku managed to defeat the boss of the area. And then they follow the path to Thirdrima and Sunraku eats an herb to increase his HP, but realizes that not even they are capable of returning him to 100% of his HP, but Amul says that this happens because he stuck the herb down his throat, and Sunraku says that's the only way the herb gets to his mouth. And well, he reflects again on Amul's incredible strength, after all he ended up being carried by the rabbit, and this hurt his pride as a player, as he is always thinking too much about himself, and so he says he will reach his level 2, but until then, Sunraku hopes that Amul works hard as his mascot. And he says that thinking that way is the only way to keep him motivated after such humiliation, well, 
Amol says that they will soon reach Thirdrima, and wonders if he would stay in rabbits the entire time after they arrive. And Sunraku says yes, but questions how he should hide it when he arrives in the city. After all they would need to avoid attracting more attention like last time, as this would result in them being attacked, to which Amol explains that he has something in mind and says that there is a lot for a long time. He hadn't worn his mysterious bracelet. And he explains that that object is the secret treasure of the Vorpal rabbits, and then the rabbit asks Sunraku to keep it with him. Then Amol disappears after activating the metamorphosis, and reappears as an ordinary girl, and says that it will allow him to let them enter the city without attracting too much attention. But upon seeing this Sunraku finds it all very strange, as he thought he was playing the best Japanese game in the world, and not some kind of harem game with an anthropomorphic rabbit girl. Well, after that Amol returns to his rabbit form, as that transformation is very tiring for him, and Amol explains that he will transform again when they get close to the city, as he can only stay in that transformation for a maximum of 5 minutes. At this Sunraku understands that in private Amol will probably have to undo the transformation, and he tells the rabbit that he made a fatal mistake in doing that, and explains that the moment he started walking with the half-naked bird man, he maximized his strangeness. And walking around with him in the form of a pretty girl will certainly be quite a challenge for the rabbit, and Amol says that his steps still seem heavy, as if they were in the swamp. Well, they finally arrive near Thirdima, and Amol says that the place is still big and lovely, as he already imagined it would be, but he notices that Sanraku doesn't seem as excited about seeing the city, and he explains that he's just used to traveling to different places, so he is not so easily impressed. And Amol says that this is incredible, because Sunraku as a pioneer, he actually travels a lot, and well, he calls Amol to move forward, and tells the rabbit to prepare to transform and eliminate supposed enemies. Well, when they get to the entrance of Thirdrima, one of the guards already finds him strange, and questions why he is half-naked, in addition the men notice that the player has some very frightening marks on his body, and to get around the situation, Amol tells the guards that Sunraku has a past that would make him sad just listening, and he explains that his friend was guided by destiny and was reborn as a super warrior, and then challenged his rival from the past life, a being called Lycaean, but in the duel he would have been hit by a curse. And Amol explains that Sunraku, upon finding himself unable to escape destiny, was forced to let himself be carried away by what destiny would grant him, and so he continues, being a solitary warrior who wanders on a journey to remove the curse that afflicts him. Then the guards try to say something, but are interrupted by Amol, who says that the Conti of the super warrior Sunraku has just arrived in the second season, but the guard was no longer able to bear hearing stories, and comments that as rare as it is to see one half-naked pioneer, they will let them pass. Then two guys watch Sunraku closely, and he notices that the men are staring at him more than usual, and possibly not just finding him strange, like other people, but Amol calls him to go quickly. But a girl pulls him by the arm, saying that she knows him, and Sanraku asks who she could be, then the anime cuts to a few hours earlier in the second ale, when they ran away from the two girls who wanted to caress Amol, and upon seeing him running away, one of the girls would have taken a photo of the rabbit to post on the game's forums and find out more about the creature. And well, after doing that, the girl opens the forum and starts writing that she was getting equipment in second ale, until she found a player with a talking rabbit, so she asks how you can get a rabbit like that too, and your post arrives even two other players, who comment on Sunraku's pervert outfits. And besides them, another player also sees the post, but says that she has never seen a creature that talks, and finally, the post reaches the girl who questioned Sunraku, and she says that the game only allows dogs and cats as partners, and not rabbits. Well, another man sees the post and complains, because the player she took the photo of clearly didn't give her permission to photograph him, but the girl feels like she didn't do anything wrong, after all, it's a game, and everyone keeps taking pictures photo every time, well, that girl from before gets angry and starts chasing Sunraku because he has a rabbit and she doesn't. And then the other players notice that Sunraku has a different tattoo that they had never seen in the entire game, besides that design was not available in the character creator, but other advanced players comment that that tattoo is the curse mark a mark which can only be dropped by Lycaon, right after the monster recognizes the player as a worthy opponent. And another player comments that Lycaon is a random event, 
so this creature could be encountered by novice players as well. But what catches his attention is the fact that Sunraku ended up with the curse mark. And well, an advanced player known as Orsalot, a member of the Ashura Kai clan, says that they could keep killing Sun Raku until he tells everything he knows about these issues involving his name, and a blonde player looks at the post and gets worried, and wonders if Sun Raku will be okay now. In this another player explains that if a player kills another player several times, he will become a PK, and when he becomes a player kill, if he is killed, all his items are lost, including those deposited, but the player remembers that this guy from Ashura Kai has already killed many people, so this would no longer be a problem for him. Well, a red-headed player, when reading about Sunraku, feels the urge to meet him, so she makes a post, and says that if he was reading that, he should go talk to a player wearing a wolf emblem and a sword, and she is very sorry that all that information about him was leaked, but says they can help him by protecting him. Well, a player notices that this girl with red hair is an advanced player, and her name is Saiger. In this he realizes that Sunraku has morals, as she is a player from a clan full of achievements, and he notices that all the other clans they are also treating him like an event boss. And then he feels like he should also go after him and makes a post saying that maybe Sunraku is in a situation he's not even aware of, and well, going back to the current moment, the girl holding him says she wants to ask him a question. However, she begins to tremble with emotion before asking him, but in the end the only thing she wanted to know was what she should do to be able to tame a Vorpal rabbit too, at which Sunraku shows surprise. But the girl tells him to stop making a fool of himself, and says that she already knows that he was walking around with a talking Vorpal rabbit, and he remembers that he was seen in the second story, and soon understands what is happening, but Sunraku doesn't. Wants to leak information about that unique scenario, what's more he doesn't even know how to activate it again. And then he just says that he doesn't know how he did that, but another girl comes on to him, and says that he shouldn't keep the information to himself, after all, everyone has the right to have fun like him, so she calls him of holy night, and Sunraku calls her the pencil warrior. However, she says that you shouldn't call a cat like her that way, and she also explains that in the world of SLF she is not the pencil warrior, and asks to be called Arthur Pensilgan, and when looking at the character's head, Sunraku notes that this is a PK, that is, a player who kills other players. After being confronted by a girl, she calls Sunraku the Revolutionary Knight, but it is explained to us that this title has no meaning in SLF, as it shows a relationship between Sunraku and another player of a certain unidentified game. And well, she tells him that she isn't the Pencil Warrior in SLF either. There she is, Arthur Pensilgan, and then when Sunraku looks at her head, he notices an indicator that she kills other players too. Furthermore, he remembers him as his friend from other bad games, but he thinks it would be good form to call her Arthur while they are playing SLF, and well, it is explained to us that the origin of this pencil warrior begins in a game known as Unite Rounds, and on a certain day in this game, a group of men invade a business and loot it, and after leaving the establishment, they celebrate, but this was short-lived, as Sunraku was there to kill them and appropriate the items they had the trouble of stealing, and this game is summarized by players as a post-apocalyptic loot game. And initially the game simulated a kingdom on the verge of collapse, where players assumed the role of knights who protect this kingdom, in other words, it was a cooperative mover game, but because the system was very poorly made, the item encounter rate was very low, including stones which had rates of a maximum of 40%, basically they were not even suitable for being thrown. And even the Gather Medicinal Herbs quest, which was considered to be for beginners, was a quest that required 12 hours of searching the open fields to find all the herbs, and obviously higher grade objects were even harder to find. And since everything was very difficult to get, the players decided that they would steal whatever they needed. After all, they need to spend 12 hours just to be able to collect an insignificant handful of herbs, so it was more viable to attack an NPC's store, or steal items from a player who has already stolen them, and at this point Unite Rounds hit the nail on the head, because there the biggest virtual thieves were concentrated. Furthermore, the game only had atrocities in enemy players, always wanting to take advantage of each other, and with that a figure emerged, knowledgeable in many of the game's tricks and also consumed by violence, and this person ended up taking over the entire kingdom, due to his wisdom in the game. In this case, it was the pencil warrior herself, and on a certain day, 
she said that they should share all the wealth of that land with everyone. So everyone starts to idolize her, and thus the kingdom of the pencil appears, but Sanraku and Katso go to the location and end up with several players trying to get their items. At this Katso questions whether they should be doing that, after all it was a game where they should defend the kingdom from monsters, and not attack it. But upon hearing this, Sanraku says that he understood that the idea of the game was to defeat the true queen of evil, in this case, the pencil warrior. However, it is explained to us that this warrior was nothing compared to the last boss of the game, so Sanraku was traveling a bit when he saw her as an evil to be fought, and this final boss is described as a person who abuses players, who does not follow her, and then she uses her agents to create an organized resistance to oppose her, and then encourage the victim's desire to fight back, as this way they would hardly give up the game. And well, they both prepare to challenge the final boss, and then they open the door, and the game Unite Rounds was for the first time catering to the whims of a single player who acted under the name Dystopia Empress. And when she sees them, she is impressed by the fact that they used the rebel army as a distraction to get to her intimate quarters, but Sanraku says he didn't have any trouble doing that, and advises Dystopia to place more efficient traps than her next time. And Katso adds, saying that they went through the traps first time, as they were very amateur, and she says their name, and states that she won't forget them, but when she looks at Sanraku, Dystopia feels a certain arrogance in the player's smile, and that irritates you. And then she draws her sword and introduces herself as the boss they will have to face, and questions whether they would have the ability to defeat her, to become the revolutionary knights, and the scene returns to the present, and Sanraku says that they already have a very long gaming history. And he says that in Unite rounds they fought until reaching a draw, with both dying in the end. But in SLF they have a big difference in level. So she goes to him and says that she took the penalty, and it came from Fifticia only to kill him, and for that he should feel proud, because not just anyone makes her take these actions. And well, she takes a distance from him and throws three knives at Sanraku, but he manages to defend himself with his Vorpal Rabbit Blade, and he tells her that his knives certainly have a poison attribute, and she just responds that they are very expensive single-use items. And the Pencil Warrior changes the subject, and asks what Sanraku's level would be, and because he killed the Mud Digger, she guesses that he is around level 30, and says that he has good dodging ability. However, Sanraku says that he can only achieve this because that game is very well made, as his movements there are very smooth, unlike when he is playing a bad game, in which case the player who was with them recognizes the pencil warrior as giant killing, and says she is second in command of the Ashura Kai, a clan that kills players. And upon hearing this, Sanraku becomes interested in this title, and the Pencil Warrior explains that she is responsible for ambushing high-level players, and that's why she ended up earning the nickname, Giant Killer, as she only kills the, Giants. However, she says that the developers adjusted some mechanics in the game that make her life much more difficult, and well, Sanraku makes fun of her, and reminds her that in the dystopia of the bad game she was the giant who ended up dying, to which he says that she didn't it's as big as your crimes. And upon hearing this, they both burst into laughter, and she says that he uses a very elaborate vocabulary for a walking bird's head, and she says that he must be studying a lot for that, but she tells him to shut up in SLF, because there she was going to kill him, and then he attacks back, and says that he only has a bird's head, not a brain. In this she says that she is not just there for personal reasons, in this case the leader of her clan also wanted her to go there and deliver a message, which would be to publish information about the unique scenario, even if to do so she needed to walk with a target on her back, that is, she is threatening Sanraku indirectly. And well, they clash again, and at a certain point Sanraku notices that he has no way out, as there is a big difference in the equipment and level of his enemy, so he tells her that the pencil warrior is trying very hard, so that he does not approach the city gate, and furthermore, he says that she certainly adjusted the time of her first attack to prevent him from entering the city, and with that he understands that it would be bad for a player killer to act in a city full of other players, after all, if she were seen, you will certainly be at risk of reprisals and attacks. And then she confesses that she avoids other players anyway, and says that he won't go through that gate, and meanwhile the girl from before is furious, because she found Sanraku first, and wanted to be talking to him about how to have a talking rabbit, but instead, 
he's fighting the giant killer. However, the girl remembers that Sun Raku was accompanied, and she realizes that she can ask his companion questions, but at that point, Amul was already reaching the limit of her transformation, and would soon return to her rabbit form. And upon seeing her, the girl notices that Sun Raku's companion is wearing rabbit accessories, and even though this is strange, the player goes to Amul, to ask a few things, whereupon Amul returns to his rabbit form, and the player soon he holds it in his lap, as if it were his property. But upon seeing this, Sun Raku understands that he can take advantage of this situation, and then the pencil warrior returns to the attack, and he kicks her away, so he asks Amul to accompany him but the player asks Sun Raku to at least let her take a photo with the bunny. And he says that if they survive, she can take the photo, and upon realizing that they were running away, the pencil warrior tries to chase them, but the player from before throws a bomb at her, making the pencil warrior stay behind. And the player says that she is not doing that because of Sun Raku, but rather for Amul, and she states that if the pencil warrior hurts that rabbit, she will be exterminated, and Sunraka notes that his strategy worked very well, and he says that Amul is very useful as a mascot. And well, he says that now all they can do is enter the city and use the teleportation to return to rabbits, but right in front of him appear some players, who came accompanied by giant killer, and to make matters worse, they were also killers of other players. And one of the players disdains Sunraku, as he thinks it's a waste of time to kill such low-level players, after all it takes away their karma points, and Branch says that's why they are sent to do the dirty work. And well, Amul says that she is already used to delegating tasks, but claims that she is already capable of fighting against the director of SF Zoo, who is a clan that documents monsters with no interest in other players, and she says that's why you should thank Sun Raku. And meanwhile, he dodges the player's blows, and says that these four players only beat him in terms of level, equipment and status, and well, the player attacks giant killer with her magic, but she reverses the attack against the player herself, and it takes away almost all of your HP. In this, the pencil warrior notices that the player works a lot on her debuffs, to help record videos of monsters, and she slowly gets up and is disbelieved by what happened with the curse she cast. And then the pencil warrior tells about a PK shaman who always tried to kill her and says that she discovered from him that curses tend to be complicated, and to avoid being hit by them, Giant says that she always carries a straw doll of punishment, because with it, she can repel any curse and play against those who attacked her. And she says it's a big problem not having one of those around, so Giant says he will be with the player in her last moments of life to watch her be killed by her own poison. And meanwhile, Sunraku continues defending himself against the other four players, and notes that he should start by attacking one in specific, as he is very confident in seeing him as a weakling, and this will give him an advantage over him. Furthermore, this enemy has a slow weapon, and so Sun Raku won't even need to use skills to dodge his attacks, but he still doesn't know how he will deal damage to higher level players, as in addition to being of higher level, they also have the best armor. And well, one of the PK is killed by another player, and the enemy player recognizes that blow as the strongest of all, and the name of the attack would be, Attack Holder, and upon hearing this, Sun Raku is confused, as he has never heard talk about this attack and soon he feels in even more danger. However, that was Rei, the girl who belonged to him, and who had been looking for him in the game for a long time, and when she saw that Hitsutome's descriptions matched, she got emotional, and said that she had finally found him, and the scene cut to some time ago, before, when she hadn't found him yet, and Rei comments to Mana that she hasn't found him in the game yet, and says that the only thing she knows about him is that Hitsutome skipped the first city, which serves as a tutorial, but Mana tries to calm her down, and the day soon Rei will find him, and she advises the girl to declare herself to Hitsutome as soon as she finds him. However, already at home, the girl regrets, and says that she is not able to find him, and in addition, she remembers that the games he usually plays are very different and difficult for her, so Rei could never find one game she could play with him, until he finally started playing SLF, and that game she was able to master. And that's why the girl was determined to find him, and so she puts on her VR and starts playing, and as soon as she logs in, Rei notices that she has a message from her sister, and she asked Rei to go talk to a character in specific, 
who was seen with a vorpal rabbit in clothes. And while she was heading to the place, Ray was remembering her sister's words where she asks the girl to find the guy with the rabbit, and she explains that he was probably already on his way to Thirdrima, and after going through all the characteristics of the player, she reveals to Ray that his name is Sunraku. Furthermore, his sister explains that many clans are already trying to contact him, including Ashura Kai, and she says that Sunraku is possibly already in the middle of a PvP battle, and well, Ray sees that as an opportunity to get closer to him. Because if she saves him from the P-Case, she will have an opening to talk to Hitsutome in the digital world, so she can later take this conversation to real life too. Then she appears there and kills the first PK in the area, and the Pencil Warrior notes that possibly those PKs wouldn't be able to finish off Sunraku anyway as the skills he got from bad games were much superior to theirs, because while they has unique items and high level status, Sunraku has the necessary technique to overcome any problem and this is a great weapon in SLF. And well, she remembers that Katso is also playing that game, and that makes their old project have some chance of happening, and after the dust settles, she manages to see Saijur, Zero, and understands that Sunraku called her to help him, in this she tries to pay as his friend, but the player behind her calls her, and says that the straw doll of the curse is very powerful, as she hit it with five spells, and even so that item reversed the your attack. However, she notices that each of the dolls can only withstand a maximum of five debuffs, and so she raises her staff and prepares to make her final counterattack. King walks towards the school, and notices Hitsutome talking to his friend about a game full of bugs, and the boy comments that besides the game being very bad, it can only be saved automatically, so his friend questions why he is playing that. And well, they arrive at school, and one of the boy's friends goes to him, and asks if he is looking for more bad games, and Ray notices that the boy is always having fun talking about these games, and because of this happiness written all over his face, she couldn't stop thinking about Hitsutome. And this extended from school to outside, and then she goes after him in the game store, and watches him with great admiration, until Mana appears behind her and immediately realizes what Ray is doing. And well, she realizes that she has already tried to talk to him countless times, and although she never managed to, Ray felt that one day she would be able to talk to him in some way, even if it was just within a game, and so we return to Shangri-La, where Sunraku was in trouble facing four PKs. Until finally a player named Saijur, Zero appears to save him, and upon seeing that player, Sunraku doesn't recognize him from anywhere, and although he doesn't appear to be a PK, Sunraku feels that player must also be behind that unique scenario, as well as the others, and then he starts to be even more in shock because another dangerous potential player has appeared, so Sunraku starts to rush to think of a way to escape, and meanwhile, the player who was challenging the pencil warrior, gets ready to attack her. And she explains that to launch her final trick, she only needs the spell mastery, skill and 1 HP, so this technique would be a suicidal curse that destroys her opponent along with her, so the pencil warrior begins to worry, and notices that the straw doll of punishment has already been consumed, that is, it does not have to reflect another curse. And then the player launches her final blow, called Fellow Traveler, and thus she finishes off the Pencil Warrior, and everyone turns their vision to that impressive and explosive scene, in which Sunraku asks Amul to open the portal immediately, and he uses Saijur, Zero as a boost to escape, but he apologizes to the player. And upon seeing this, the four PKs despair, and Sunraku tells them not to let their guard down next time, but they were still willing to prevent him from reaching the city, and well, Sunraku looks back, and promises that at least will remember Saijur Zero's name. And finally, he reaches the city, and the four PKs complain to Saijur, Zero for having disturbed them, so the leader tells him not to underestimate Ashura Kai, and although Rei is being threatened, she just keeps thinking about the interaction she had with Hitsutome, even if it was a simple game, after all he finally spoke to her. The PKs are left without understanding anything, and the leader notices that the player has opened his guard, so this would be the best time to kill the attack holder, 
because if he manages to finish off a warrior of that level, he will certainly increase his level in the future. Ashura Kai. And then Rei summons herself, because if it weren't for those annoying players, she could have talked a lot more with Hitsutome, in which she cuts the player in half, and the others who are left are scared and plan to escape, but attack holder raises his sword to them too, and says he will have to take his anger out on them too. And then they both shiver even more, and meanwhile, Sanraku finally manages to escape with Amul, and stays there disdaining the PKs who wanted his head, after all they couldn't pursue them even in rabbits, as this is a unique scenario that only he has access to. But still, Sanraku feels that this experience was very scary, as he didn't count on being chased, and besides, he was low on mana for combat, and Amul says he used all his mana too, when transforming. And Sanraku comments that they would have big problems if they couldn't move from Thirdrima, and well, he notes that he made a great choice in buying some mana restoring items, besides, they had finally managed to accomplish the objective. And after that incident, the pencil warrior had sent him a message, being a bad loser, as usual. And in the email she attributed the blame for his death solely to herself, so she does not consider that she was defeated by him in any way, in addition, she says she is not sure if attack holder was really just concerned with helping Sanraku, and she wonders if he would be any friend of hers. However, Sanraku doesn't know the name, attack holder, and believes that the pencil warrior is talking about Saiger, Zero, and well, she says that it doesn't matter, and asks to talk to him, and for that she says she will call Katso for a meeting at Unite Rounds, and says he will schedule everything later. He finds it strange that she wants to talk to him outside of SLF, and then when searching his email box, he notices that he received an email from Katso, and there he explains that he received an invitation email from Pencil Warrior, and Katso questions what Sunraku would have done to her. And then he reads this email and finds it really strange, but he doesn't hide that he is curious about this story, and Katso says that he is also very interested in hearing what she has to say to them, and that's why he asks Sunraku go to the meeting for sure. At this Hitsutome confirms his presence, as he is not capable of refusing to do something if his friend puts pressure on his shoulders, but at the moment Sanraku has more important things to do, and so he apologizes to Amul for making him wait, and says that now they will finally start exploring the unique setting like they should. And Amul jumps with joy, at which Sanraku questions what they could start doing, and he remembers that Vash has been training him since the last time they saw each other, and then Amul says he will take him to the arena where they do most of the battle training. And as they continue further, they arrive at a giant arena, called a Vorpal Colosseum, and Sanraku notices that the place is really huge, and Amul explains that his training will be to fight against 10 monsters there, and then Sanraku understands that the training consists of in defeating several strong enemies in a row. However, Amul informs him that he will not be able to use Vorpal weapons in combat, but Sanraku does not show fear about this, and says that it is time to climb several levels until he finally removes the arrogant smile from the pencil warrior's face. Then he starts to warm up for the fight and tells the rabbit to send the first enemy, and then Sanraku feels that the best thing to do is not try to kill 10 enemies at once, instead, his strategy will be to abuse of trial and error, so he can learn the attack patterns of each enemy, because this way he will be able to beat everyone consequently. And well, the first training opponent practical appears, but they are the dogs of the pack, so they appear in groups of 5 dogs or even more, and the average level of this enemy is around 65, so Sanraku feels a certain fear, as those enemies appear to be quite strong. And then he questions whether that is right, after all they are putting him to fight against level 65 enemies, and Amul explains that that is the first monster he will have to face, and Sanraku corrects him, saying that that would be his first fight and not his first fight against a monster. And meanwhile, Rei is all happy when she remembers that she had contact with Hitsutome, and she thinks back to that moment when he jumped on her head to get momentum and apologize to her. And then she promises herself that when she meets him again, she will find the courage to send a friend request to Hitsutome, but she wonders if he would accept, and soon Rei visualizes him accepting her request without hesitation and thanking her again for saved your skin that day. Then she starts tossing and turning in bed with excitement, but she remembers that when she entered Thirdrima, she didn't find him there even though she looked for him a lot, but she believes that Hitsutome just logged out. And returning to the fight, Sanraku continues to be distressed by that situation, 
and thinks he will be devoured again by those beasts, and then Amul informs him that this is his seventh attempt, and Sunraku explains that by dying in an arena he has no type of penalty. And he notes that the problem with those dogs is not their quantity or level, but rather the synchronized way in which they attack, and for Sunraku, those beasts would be receiving orders from some commander as this alone explains the great synchronization of their attacks. However, Sunraku had already fought with them a lot, and he noticed that one of the monsters always stood howling from a safe distance, and never attacked him. Then Sunraku aims his attack at that dog, as he believes that he would be the commander who coordinates the attack of the other dogs in the pack, and then he attacks him with the spiral technique skill, but the dog runs in another direction to continue attacking him. The orders. But this was enough for Sunraku to realize that their coordination was over, therefore his deduction was correct, and upon knowing this, he could continue ignoring the other dogs and focus only on the commander, to prevent him from giving orders to the others again. Dogs. And then he starts attacking the commander until he kills him, Amol gets excited and says that Sunraku did very well, and now that the leader of the gang is gone, Sunraka notices that the other enemies are much more disoriented and weak, and with that he manages to wipe out all the dogs in the pack, and Sunraku explains that by discovering their trick they become just resistant dogs, and then he finally sells the first opponent of practical training, and Amul congratulates him on a job well done, and he just wishes that the next enemy wouldn't be several, and the rabbit states that the next one will be just the same, but when he sees the monster Sunraku is scared in the same way, after all it was a tentacle monster with several heads, basically it was still a group of enemies. However, he manages to defeat the monster too, as he discovered that the real enemies were the tentacles, and not the bear, so he just had to keep dodging the bear and attacking the tentacles, and upon killing the seventh tentacles, the bear consequently stopped attacking. Move 2, and thus he defeated the second enemy of practical training. The third opponent, he was a goblin berserker, and for Sunraku, it didn't matter if he was a strong goblin or not, at the end of the day he was still a goblin, therefore he was the easiest enemy to defeat so far. And the fourth enemy was a Dino Boar, and its main ability consisted of exploding the enemy while attacking it, and in addition, the Dino Boar had outstanding resistance, but Sunraku discovered that the monster only runs 20 seconds at a time. Time and he was only able to discover it so quickly precisely because he already had experience with the mechanical bull, otherwise it would have taken him longer to discover it. And then he advances to the fifth opponent of practical training, which in this case was a toxic eagle, which flies at an unreachable distance while throwing poison bombs, but Sanraka manages to defeat it. In this he goes for the sixth opponent, but the armor larva was easier to defeat than the toxic eagle himself, the seventh opponent, he was an execution panther, and although she is fast and strong, she does not it's that resilient. And Sunraku soon understands that the panther's strategy is to go after him and attack far from his line of sight, therefore he is an easy enemy to defeat, in this we arrive at the eighth opponent of practical training, but Sunraku describes him just as a normal monster, without anything very different. And then he moves on to the ninth opponent, and his name was, Beta Golem Unit S2, and Sunraka notices that when the enemy connects an A attack twice, there is almost no difference in timing in the attack, however if he goes from the A position for B, or vice versa, the core in your chest rises for a second, and realizing this all gives you anticipation of the enemy's attacks. And Sunraku says he came up with a theory the moment he dodged one of the golem's attacks, in which case he realized that his hitting area disappeared, and with that Sunraku was able to jump onto the enemy's arm and attack the core directly. But in doing so, he ended up being repelled by an invisible energy field that took away 70% of his HP, and so he was forced to change his strategy, and Sunraku began trying to remove the golem's armor, to expose the golem's armor. Your weak point. In this he finally manages to kill him after a long time, and with that he was only missing one more enemy, and when looking at his level, Sunraku is disappointed, because even though he had fought against several monsters, he only rose two levels, and all this for account for your Vorpal Necklace which cuts your experience points in half. And then Amul notices that Sunraku has a scary look on his face, 
and asks him to rest a little. But Sunraku cynically responds that all that optimization is great for him, so he asks Amul to send the last monster quickly. And Vash appears there, and says that Sunraku defeated the ninth monster at the right time, and then he questions who his tenth opponent would be, and Vash explains that it will be a monster captured by himself. So he throws the creature into the arena and gives the command for her to get up. And Sunraku is in doubt as to what that being was, but Vash explains that that thing was a human who a long time ago tried to merge with a tree to gain more lifespan, and he would be a very strong opponent that Sunraku possibly wouldn't have. Ability to win, which is why Vash determines another victory criterion. In this case, Sunraku would have to survive the fight for at least 5 minutes, and with that the 10th opponent is revealed, and he would be the convicted wood wizard, in which Sunraku tries to negotiate these 5 minutes, as he thinks it is too little time. But the wizard doesn't give him time to speak and attacks him, and then Sunraku feels that the enemy is really strong, as he wasn't even able to visualize the attack. And well, Vash says he's a fan of Sunraku's confidence, and so he wants him to show a little more of that courage. And after having a little more contact with the creature, Sunraku realizes that those five minutes will be much longer than he thought, in which it is explained to us that of all 30 million SLF players, Sunraku is the first to fight against that creature. Monster, but it would still take him a long time to discover this, after all, it was a level 120 creature. Sunraku keeps dodging off the monster's attacks, until he finally gets an opening to attack too, but in doing so, he finds the creature's body strange, and wonders what it is made of, and then he understands that physical blows will not work with that monster. Then he dodges the blows again, as Sunraku thinks this is the only option he has left, and then Amul informs him that he has already lasted a full minute, so there are only four hands left and Vash asks Sunraku to show him all his power, of your vorpal soul, and he just keeps dodging the blows, and notices that that monster is in fact very heavy, as it has root spears that it attacks almost without moving, in addition to its chains that seem like they will cause status when touching its target. And both the blades and the chains follow Sunraku in a very natural way, as if they were made exclusively to catch him, but this is what gives him the motivation to dodge the attacks. And well, Sunraku continues dodging, until the creature attacks him with magic too, but he manages to dodge it, and Sunraku notices that as time passes, he changes the types of his attacks, to always be surprising him, and with that he becomes he questions whether the game is programmed so that the monster's attacks become more dense, as only this can explain that creature. Furthermore, the number of chains and roots increases over time, as for the magical attacks, they cover an even larger area of the scene, and Sunraka notes that if the density of the attacks does not cease, he will die even before to reach 5 minutes. And well, the monster attacks with a new spell from its arsenal, and mixes it with all its other attacks, and then Sunraku is left wondering what kind of being that is, after all it nullifies the possibility of being attacked at the same time as add your own attacks to the battle. And thinking about it this way, Sunraku feels that he would have a better chance of beating even Lycaon, as he is tired of having to resist that hell, and so he has the idea of ingesting some glucose, to be able to think better about a new combat strategy, especially because he can take risks, after all he won't be penalized for dying. However, soon after Sunraku has a lapse of sanity, and notices that he is thinking like a loser, and he says that he did not expect to beat the first 10 monsters at once, in which he compares this monster with the mud digger, and if he remembers when he almost died in that other fight, in which case he could already be considered a loser, after all it was a mole who saved him that day. And when he remembers this, Sunraku gets angry and attacks the minister, and he feels that playing bad games for so long has turned his brain into a trash can, and for him, having an overdose of bad games is nothing. Good, so he must balance this by playing a divine game every now and then. And Sunraku notes that he only has two options in front of him, the first is to give up on that event where his death will not make him lose anything, or he can take shortcuts on that event that has not yet been completely released. And while he fights, Vash notices that the boy went through all the waves of attacks, until he was able to land a physical attack on the monster, but all this is of no use, since Sunraku can only use basic attacks. And well, he manages to knock down the monster's staff, and this way, even if the creature nullifies physical damage, the attack will still work, 
but the creature still tries to take his staff, but Sunraku stops him, and says that a beautiful staff such things cannot be in the hands of such a hideous creature. Furthermore, Sunraku is very curious to know what will happen to the creature if it is left without its staff, in this case, what he expected happened, the creature went crazy and started attacking him only with chains and blades. In which Sunraku says that the looting skills he learned in Unite Rounds should not be underestimated. And upon seeing this, Vash praises the boy, but he reminds him that Sunraku still needs to resist for two more minutes, and Vash says that he still won't be able to breathe calmly, so the monster attacks again, and Sunraku realizes that losing the staff made the creature lose control too as the monster started to attack more than normal. And Sunraku calls him sly because it's disproportionate to be so angry just for a little staff and meanwhile Amul cheers for his victory and warns him that he only needs to survive for one more minute and well, Sunraku gets closer to the creature and he is soon caught by his chains. And then he realizes that they are enough to even overcome Lycane's mark and in this way, Sunraku is unable to dodge the attacks so the monster tells him to return his staff and he throws the staff away, and orders it to be picked up. However, he did this just to save time, and Sunraku calls the monster an idiot because in doing so, the creature had to release the roots and chains from its body, thus causing Sunraku to stop losing damage, and then the five minutes arrive. To the end, but the creature continues attacking him, and Sunraku charges the monster, saying that time is up but Vash goes there and explains that the idea for the fight to last only 5 minutes was his, and not the monsters. And well, he finishes the creature, and tells Sunraku that he showed his vorpal soul but he can only pay attention to how Vash defeated the monster, after all he nullifies physical attacks. But Vash explains that this only happens when the monster is holding the staff because without the staff he is just an immobile tree, and upon hearing this, Sunraku understands why he wants the staff so much and turns back. And well, with that he asks if he has already won the mission, and Vash answers yes, and says that he will win a prize for this, and the prize is a title of citizen of the Kingdom of Rabbits, and Amul jumps with joy, saying that this is something incredible, but Sunraku doesn't seem to be that excited about this reward, and he wonders if he would get a rare item, or something like that. Then Vash just takes off his vorpal collar dot and his neck, and says that from now on he will no longer need it, and thus Sunraku concludes the unique scenario, Rabbit's Invitation. And after that, a unique extra scenario appears in his status, but Sunraku was unable to do it, after all he didn't win a single item, so Hitsutome takes off the VR and goes to sleep. And the next day, Sunraku reads a little more about the other unique scenario he unlocked, and he even wants to play it, but he doesn't know how to start, Besides, the recommended level for the event is 80, and when reading the word, divine, in the event notes, Sunraku remembers that this is about a civilization that died long ago. And the only thing he remembers is that this civilization had a gigantic plot about its history, and this made Hitsutome give up reading about it, so getting useful information out of it will be very difficult, in this he remembers that there are clan's entire pages dedicated to discovering more of the game's plot so it's no surprise that it has a lot of information about it. And so he decides to leave this unique scenario story for later, for now Sunraku will take a look at the city and proceed to the next area, but he remembers that going out looking like that is not a good idea, because that way he will be attacked by PKs and information hunters. And then Sunraku notices that if he just changes the clothes on his head, Lycaean's mark will still attract attention, and because he can't equip anything on his torso and legs, it will be impossible to hide the mark so Amul gives him the tip to hide it, his whole body, and says he knows a place where Sunraku will find what he needs. And then they go to Pete's, and Sunraku recognizes that place as a store exclusive to Rabbit's palace, and Amul introduces that Rabbit as his little brother, and says that he buys things and sells them in that kingdom, but Pete's explains that he also he sells it in other cities, but he explains that he doesn't sell it very often because in doing so he needs to transform into a human. And he says that if Sunraku sees him around, he can talk to him, Nis Peets calls him Mr. Bird, and Sunraku explains that it's just a mask, and then he takes it off and reveals that he's a human, and upon seeing this, Amal is surprised, as he thought Sunraku had some reason for not taking off his mask and he says he has no problem taking it off. But Amul says it's better for him to always keep the mask on, and well, 
he asks Pete to show the fabric he had recently acquired, so Sunraku puts on the clothes and goes back to the inn, to get a map of Thirdrima from a girl, which, by the way, is strange about the clothes he was wearing. And when he leaves there, Sunraku starts to complain about that equipment because even though it covers the Lycane brand, going around with that is a joke, and Amul says that if he keeps shouting like that he'll end up attracting the attention of others, but he says that having that equipment will attract enough attention. However, Amul asks him to control himself Wenless as they leave the city and he accepts to be cool, especially because he already has the recovery items and the map he needed, but he complains about the fact that Amul always needs to take the items to recover MP, so he decides to hurry and go to the next region quickly before Sunraku runs out of items. And when opening his status, he notices that there are three places they can go from Thirdrima, the first is the Prismatic Forest Cave which is on the way to Forfolkshire, and Amul explains that the place is a labyrinth of caves, full of plant life, and that's why the place is full of flowers of all colors, and the second place they can go is the Lake of the Caldera of the Fall of Civilization. And this place is a volcano with a lot of water accumulated in its crater, and finally, they can also go to the Iron Ruins of the Divine, on the way to Sixenveld, these are ruins from the Era of the Divine, and it gets its name from account of the various iron plates. And having explained all the locations, Sunraku is undecided on which one to follow, and compares it to a war game, where he needs to decide which group to play with and which place to explore, so this is a very complex decision to make. However, Amul suggests that he start by going to the Caldera Lake of the Fall of Civilization, but Sunraku asks for silence to decide, and then he says that the best thing is for them to go to the Prismatic Forest Cave, and he chose this place precisely to avoid the Iron Ruins of the Divine. For even though the place promises scientific prizes, this is nothing more than a trap, and as he travels through his explanation, Amul notices a familiar person watching them, and when Sunraku looks back, he realizes that it is Saiger, Zero. And meanwhile, the leader of Ashura Kai scolds his men, and says that they tarnished the clan's name, but one of the henchmen explains that they ended up running into attack holder, so they could not win or predict this threat. Then Orcelot says again that what was at stake was a unique scenario, so they should have found a way, and upon hearing this, the pencil warrior questions why he hadn't personally gone on this mission, and Orcelot replies that he didn't. I had time. And then he goes back to talking about the rabbit that was with that player, and he comments about it being something unique in the game, besides, they are dealing with a newbie who barely knows the system, so they must keep threatening him until he speak what you know. At this the pencil warrior suggests that they deal with something else first, and she calls this thing, that, but Orcelot appears to be tired of talking about it, and he explains that unique monsters are not meant to be defeated, and at the moment they are the only ones who know the conditions for that thing to appear. And he explains that just by encountering this they already gain experience, so if they use it well, everyone can use this to increase the Ashura Kai's combat power. And the clan members comment that they would not benefit from fighting that thing, as fighting seriously would only waste their items, and upon seeing that her colleagues are very lazy, the pencil warrior decides to leave the place, and says who also has no time for discussions. And as she leaves the meeting, she reflects on Ahura Kai, and explains that the clan used to attract everyone's hate, as their philosophy was to surf the hate, but a new update has appeared, and with it it has become more risky kill other players, and then Ashura Kai ended up changing its way of acting to avoid the danger. And the Pencil Warrior states that an Ashura Kai that seeks stability has no way of defeating that, and she says she is still in disbelief at the fact that she will risk her neck for a simple NPC, after all this is a big bet where she you can win or lose. And she explains that to bury that monster, one of the seven most powerful, weathermen, was summoned, and now she wants Set to watch her in action, and well, Sunraku makes up his mind and says that they will go to the prismatic forest grotto first. And while he justifies his decision, Amul notices that that same person from before was watching them, and Sunraku recognizes him as Saiger, Zero, and then he deduces that the player went there to take revenge for the step on him. So he decides to run away, and on the other side of the city, two of the Ashura members look for the Birdman, but they feel that Sunraku is already in another area but when they look at a guy running desperately, they notice that it is the bird man. And one of the henchmen comments that that cloth is not enough for Sunraku to hide from them, 
and so they start to chase him, and he warns a mole that they should leave for the next area in which one of the Ashura Kai deduces that Sunraku is going to the Iron Ruins, and the other henchman suggests that they set up an ambush at the gate to that area. And well, Amul explains that Destiny their starting point was the Parismatic Forest Cave but if they continue along that path they will reach the Iron Ruins of the Divine, and Sunraku explains that that is just a bluff, because if he went straight to his true destination, the Ashura Kai would would reach it at the same time so his plan is to make them think he is heading for the ruins. But halfway through he will divert his route and go to the cave in the Prismatic Forest, and thus, his enemies will be waiting for him at the wrong gate, and well, the henchmen lose sight of him and decide to just go straight to the gate of the ruins. And then Sanraku explains to Amul that to deceive your enemy, you always need to prepare at least one obvious lie. And he reveals that he learned this from Pensilgan, but halfway through he is surprised by attack holder. Then he starts to feel shocked, but the player just wanted to send him a friend request, and he says he wanted to be friends with Sanraku, but the player speaks very quietly, and he only hears a woman's voice coming from that player. And then he becomes more attentive about this, because that friend request could be a way to make him lower his guard. But soon after he understands that this doesn't make sense, because if that were the case he would have already been killed. So the only answer to this, is that attack holder would be genuinely interested in being friends with him. But Sanraku also distrusts this friendship, and deduces that this player only wants to get closer with the intention of obtaining information about the unique scenario, and then he begins to reflect on Siger Zero's sagacity, as she was able to predict even his real destiny, and so he feels that she is up to something. However, he considers himself an experienced and well-experienced gamer, so it won't be a problem to face her if Siger Zero has bad intentions, and when he accepts the request, Siger Zero is embarrassed, and Rei explains that after losing Hitsutome of Seen, she didn't know what to do, but she remembered that upon arriving in Thurdrima, she traveled to the forest cave first, so he could also be going there. And well, Siger Zero offers to help Sunraku in his game, but he deduces in his mind that the player just wants to leave him indebted for his favors, to then extract information from him, and so he thanks him for his help. Siger Zero but decides to refuse, as he's not a big fan of winning things through force. Then the player apologizes for trying to ruin his fun, and wishes him good luck with his game, and Sunraku takes the opportunity to apologize for having used her as a stepping stone at that moment, but Siger Zero says it was nothing, and so they they say goodbye. And Amul comments that that pioneer appears to be a very strong player, and Sunraku suggests that she is at least four times stronger than him, but Amul says that the potential of her Vorpal soul will make him stronger. So he continues to doubt what this Vorpal soul could be, but he decides to put it aside, as he feels like he's been thinking too much lately, and well, Siger Zero notices that the girl who was accompanying him didn't have a name. Player in her head, but she doesn't care about that, after all the important thing is that now Hitsutome was her friend in the game. And meanwhile, the members of Ashura Kai realize the distraction that Sunraku had created for them, and so they decide to go look for them in the right place, but they come face to face with the attack holder again, and decide to try that later. And upon arriving at the cave, Sunraku takes off his cloth armor, and Amul comments that even though the place is a cave, it is still very bright, and he notices that the glow comes from the moss on the walls. And as they enter further into the location, they come across an elegant and very colorful setting, and there they encounter several distinct and different monsters from anywhere in the game, such as the Deposit Butterfly and the Empire Worker Bee. And Sunraku shows all his enthusiasm in getting to know a new area, and he hopes to win some very expensive item there, so he tries to attack a storage butterfly, but he misses the blow because the monster can easily dodge attacks. But he tries again, and finally, Sunraku defeats the first monster in the area, and in doing so, he takes the butterfly's belly, to use as an item, and when checking the statuses, he notices that the object is called Bag of Deposit Butterfly Nectar. And Amul is very excited that he got you that item, and Sunraku says that his plan is to keep getting more items, until he reaches the boss of the area and finishes him off, and going further, Sunraku notices an enemy from afar, 
and then he takes out his throwing knife. And he explains that because his only way of fighting is melee, he was very traumatized in the fight against the toxic eagle, and that's why he decided to have weapons that can be attacked from a long distance. And then Sunraku attacks the praying mantis camouflage, and then defeats him, in which Amol again praises his sagacity, and Sunraku explains that these guys are nothing without their ambushes in the form of camouflage. And Amol informs him that he must have already collected a lot of items, and when looking at his status, he comments that he actually has a lot of items, but there is still a monster that he hasn't defeated, and speaking of him, the creature appears. And the size of the beetle impresses him because that monster must be at least 5 meters long, and Amul explains that it is a quad beetle that is drinking the sap in the territory of the Empire's bees, and Sunraku deduces that a fight is going to break out. So, and there's no other way, the bees start attacking the beetle together, and Sunraku goes down there and starts narrating the fight in a relaxed way, and he aims the mushroom microphone at Amul and asks her what she thinks of the fight, but she he appears to be out of touch with the subject and says he doesn't know much about these monsters. And then Sunraku just asks her to improvise, so as not to ruin the atmosphere, and while the fight unfolds, he continues narrating the facts, and Amul continues to be disappointed by his weak and dull comments. And well, the quad beetle gets tired of playing with the bees and decides to attack the queen bee, because when he takes her out of the game the other bees also disperse, and so the beetle can go back to feeding peacefully, until he notices the presence of Sunraku and advances towards him. And Sunraku tries to calm him down, saying that he only wanted the queen bee's items, and Amul explains that he must possibly think that they went there to steal his sap and upon hearing this, Sunraku has the idea of throwing the bag of nectar under a mantis, camouflaged god. And then he discovers that the beetle was actually after it, and after distracting it, Sunraku takes advantage of that opportunity to attack it, after all the bees had already left it weakened enough, so he starts to land several critical blows on the creature and the defeat. And when opening his inventory, he notices that it is full, so Sunraku can take a break from collecting items for now, but Amul says he does not agree with the fact that he took advantage of the work done by the bees, but Sunraku states that in the that's how things work in the wild. And well, when looking up, he comes across a spider web, and because the boss of the area is a spider, he believes that very close to the end, and as he continues further, he comes face to face with the clown spider. And this was another video on the channel. If you liked it and want more videos like this, subscribe and leave a like, see you in the next one.